Good afternoon, everyone. It has just passed noon, so it is afternoon, and uh, one session lies between us and lunch, uh, but it's one of extreme importance uh, thematically to what is developing into, I think, a really interesting and uh, important conference, and uh, we'll have a discussion at the end where I hope some of the themes that, will, that have been sort of bubbling up through all the papers uh, will be able to be, uh, to be explored fully uh, with a panel discussion. Um, this session is called Labouring the Artwork, a very important uh, theme for the Pre-Raphaelites, one that they uh, self-consciously address quite regularly in their own thinking um, and writing, and of course very visibly in the, uh, in the artwork which we can see downstairs. Um, as in the previous sessions, I won't give full uh, biographies for the speakers, um, but I do want to introduce our first speaker, um, Deborah Lamb. Uh, Deborah is a lecturer at the University of Bristol. She's completing a book relating to the topic of her talk today, but she's also working on a very important second book, which is called Effort in the Long 19th Century. That's a really fantastic uh, and important theme. But today's paper is called Hard Work, Soft Work, Dante, Gabriel's, uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti's Effort. Okay, um, in relation, I should say. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Thanks. Um, right. okay. um, thank you, Tim, and thank you to the organisers and speakers um, who have really made this conference a really brilliant one. Um, I'm going to start with this pen and ink drawing um, of Fra Angelico painting. In it, Fra Angelico works on a picture of the Virgin Mary, if you can see that there, with the infant Christ in her arms. Um, a fellow friar perches against the top of the low easel reading a book, complete with badly cut tonsure. I think um, a fellow friar did him wrong there. Um, <laughs> as distracting as this crowded workspace and bad haircut should be, Fra Angelico is completely absorbed in his painting. I know we looked at absorption um, in the previous panel. His nose is inches away from the surface of the picture, suggesting the concentration of his detailed work. He kneels as if in prayer, um, a rather uncomfortable position, I think you'd agree, um, for slow, precise painting. Because of his proximity to the canvas as well, his arms are folded in a way that makes it look like he is praying to the image of his own creation. More than that, um, you know, more than just showing Fra Angelico at work, I think Rossetti's drawing emphasises the effort of this monk-like devotion to art. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I'm going to be looking at um, visualisations of Rossetti's effort and the intellectual coordinates of that. Um, so, you know, just to briefly gloss my, my um, thinking around effort, eluding the, I think, political and quantitative associations of the term labour. Um, effort, I think, is a more slippery, entangled word, which I like precisely because of this entangledness. It encapsulates the intangible, softer aspects of work. So while the painstaking detail of Rossetti's pre-Raphaelite art has often been remarked upon, I think the vivid forms of his later paintings also demonstrates the kind of um, intense, obsessive effort that I think is specific to him. In a recap of a lecture on Dante Gabriel Rossetti and Holman Hunt, um, Ruskin is really quick to disambiguate connections almost as fast as he makes them. And Ruskin claims that, um, makes a claim for minuteness for himself. He says it is Turnerian and Ruskinian, not pre-Raphaelite at all. The pre-Raphaelitism, Ruskin says, common to us all is the frankness and honesty of the touch, not in its dimensions. So, Attending to effort then reframes Rossetti's artistic labour and provides a new perspective on the complex of this sincerity and earnestness. 
Rossetti would periodically return to this subject of painters' paintings throughout the 1850s, and this is um, the th these are broadly the three paintings that I will be looking at in uh, greater detail. In the tradition of this genre is, of course, St. Luke, who is often depicted as painting portraits of the Virgin Mary, particularly in late medieval and early Renaissance paintings by um, artists of the Guild of St. Luke. Rossetti is very likely to have seen one of these paintings during his trip to Paris and Belgium in the autumn of 1849, but he would have been familiar with this depiction of St. Luke either way from the engraving that was the frontispiece of William Otley's Italian School of Design. So Rossetti picks up this theme in multiple pictures of Giotto painting Dante's portrait, of which the sketch on the left, so this one here, is currently in the exhibition. Rossetti here allegorizes the transition of artistic fame in this imagined scene as Giotto is seated on the platform um, painting Dante's portrait in fresco, so Dante, Dante's portrait. Um, to the left of Dante is the older um, poet Cavalcanti, who leers behind him in a rather strange visualization of the inheritance of artistic fame, and intrusively peering over um, Giotto's shoulder is his master Cimabue on the ladder. Very dangerous, don't do that. Um, so... I'm interested in all these pictures and really happy to talk about them, but the, the picture I'm really interested in from this set that I'm interested in talking about is not this sketch or the more completed painting, but the later watercolour with a simplified design. I love this so much. Um, in this unfinished picture, Rossetti frames what Alberto Lopez Cuenca calls the spectacle of performing artistic labour. This picture negotiates the double currency of artistic labor as it both depicts in what Tim Barringer might, um, might call a man at work and shows Rossetti's work mid-process in its unfinishedness. So compared to the previous sketch, and I can go back to that. Oh, no, ruined it altogether. Yep, yeah, there we go. Compared to the previous sketch, um, the simplified design centers the act of painting. The procession clustered in the corner in the previous one is cut out. The picture is one looming predecessor less and the other no longer hovers oppressively. Um, the narrowing of perspective also obscures the setting of the platform, um, but the sketched head in fresco is now in focus. Oh, I'm very bad at controlling this. Yeah, it's now in focus. Okay, there we go. Um, even though it is less defined than in the study, but it's more a centerpiece here. This, in this obviously unfinished sketch, the underpainting of Giotto's body hunched over the quickly filled in outline of Dante's head, which Giotto is drawing, and the finish of Giotto's controlled grasp of his own hand, steadying his hand there, which disappears into the preparatory sketching these visible signs of Rossetti's working all display the efforts of his and Giotto's endeavour. The picture here depicts the intense effort of Giotto's close observation, but it too is the result of Rossetti himself looking closely. Where Giotto's intense gaze registers a commitment to painting Dante faithfully from life, Rossetti's fidelity is to a historical Dante mediated through art. Having never been to Italy himself, um, Rossetti's Italy is, I would argue, a literary one. The Dantes in the picture, both the sitter and the one in the fresco, are based on a sketch by Seymour Kirkup, um, who traced the portrait of Dante on a fresco by Giotto in the chapel of the Palazzo del Podesta in Florence. Um, so Kirkup um, found, it, um, along with other colleagues, found this, um, this, this fresco underneath some whitewash and sent it to 
uh, sent a copy to Gabriele Rossetti. The, score, the small watercolour sketch um, was passed on from Gabriele, Dante Gabriel's father, to Dante Gabriel, and Dante Gabriel kept it with him until his death in 1882, and it is listed in the catalogue of his belongings uh, for auction of that year. It is now untraced, but we get a sense of the original drawing it is based on, um, because Kirkup made, um, basically made that sketch from a copy of, um, from the original, which is in his uh, copy of Dante's Convivio, now in the Bargello Museum, seen here. So even with less context in this more generalised scheme of this unfinished picture, the attentiveness to the historical accuracy of Dante's corresponding likeness conveys, I think, the laboured realism of Giotto's endeavour. Similar to the Fra Angelico drawing, the act of painting is not simply dramatised into a gestural posture. Rossetti here shows an especial interest in representing the effortful details of such artistic labour. Fra Angelico's devotional closeness and Giotto's steady supporting hand both convey how deeply these figures are engaged in painting. Beyond representing artistic labour, these pictures are attentive to the effort and work underpinning the process of painting and reflect how Rossetti perceived his own artistic endeavours. So in addition to historical and cultural um, networks and um, that contextualises Rossetti's effort, I also want to think about the usefulness of um, oppositional relations in critical responses to such efforts. So I'm thinking here as well about Rossetti's effort, not just in relation, but in opposition. Ruskin was very conscious of this earnestness and Rossetti's overly fastidious tendencies. In a letter to Rossetti, Ruskin warns that the labored picture um, must only be an exercise, not a result, and counsels Rossetti to try doing careless or slight works sometimes, just sometimes. Um, this personal frustration with Rossetti's art as his friend was really interesting, and Ruskin had to negotiate his personal frustrations with Rossetti's art as his friend, while also um, looking and contextualizing Rossetti's pre-Raphaelite affiliations as an art critic, and what you know he's doing very art historical work. Ruskin is, um, so he sees this effort as an extension of pre-Raphaelite overwork. Um, already in the more public discourse of his, yeah, there we go. Already in um, the more public discourse of his 1851 pamphlet on pre-Raphaelitism, Ruskin complains they are working too hard. There is evidence in failing portions of their pictures, showing that they have wrought so long upon them that their sight, that their very sight, has failed for wariness. Um, I really. I'm interested in this particular quotation because identifying failing portions of their pictures that show visible signs of fatigue um, really points to Ruskin's way of reading, and that's his term for analytically looking at art, um, Ruskin's way of reading the labour involved in the creation of a picture, which I think is also an argument for the discernible quality of effort in the surface of a work of art. So in contrast to pre-Raphaelite overwork, um, Ruskin also outlines one of the most articulated discussions of his ideal of ease in that same pamphlet. I quote, the freedom of the lines of nature, Ruskin suggests, can only be represented by a similar freedom in the hand that follows them. The curves in the flow of the hair and in the form of the features, the muscular outline of the body, can only be caught by a sympathetic freedom in the stroke of the pencil. The analogy between the lines of drawing and the lineaments of nature offers an alternative aesthetic relation that's really interesting. In place of the pre-Raphaelite's fidelity and vraisemblance, we have Ruskin here exerting a correspondence between the organicity of the effortless ease of execution and the very state of nature itself. Um, I don't have time to dwell on this um, 
in some relation, maybe some relations are too tenuous, um, but I'm really happy to, to talk about this example in the discussion later. Um, the years that passed in the mid-1850s uh, afforded Rossetti greater distance from the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, and the subject of painter's painting became even more reflexive. Um, Rossetti presents a variation on the theme in his painting St. Catherine, also at the exhibition, that is drastically at odds with the religious portrayals of the saint that he was familiar with, um, thinking of Hans Memling's um, uh, The Marriage of St. Catherine. It is also very different from the painting shown here on the right, which was acquired by the National Gallery the same year Rossetti painted his picture. It is also the only oil painting he completed in this period, which is often thought of as his hiatus from oil, so this provides a really interesting um, exception to that. Rossetti explained to John Miller, who purchased the painting a, a year later, he explains that I mean the lady to be a person of wealth, probably the donor of the picture in hand to some church, wishing the figure of the saint to be her own portrait. He says, the period is not early enough for this vanity on her part to be out of place, I think, um, which is quite rich coming from Rossetti. Um, the period... So, okay, in, in the artist's studio then, this wealthy woman poses as the saint with props, the halo attached to her headdress, looks really uncannily like um, a wheel with spokes in itself. Um, you know, it's such a material supplement for the glowing aureoles of the medieval pictures. Artistic labour here is commercialised in the patronage system. Anonymous pupils and studio assistants replace Dante and Giotto, but they will not inherit their master's artistic fame. Yet, signs of degrees of effort and artistic labour are everywhere in this picture. As Rossetti describes, the pupils behind are all engaged in a rapid act of painting a martyrdom of St. Sebastian. So that's them there in the corner, you can see. So... Um, as pupils, as various pupils begin to work on different parts of the compositional sketch in the left, in the top left corner, one student is comically draped over the canvas. I don't know if you can see him there. Um, sort of um, applying wash upside down, holding a cup of paint at a really precarious angle. Um, so this rapid, careless work and the boredom of the boy who eats a biscuit while holding the train of the patrons, um, the patroness's uh, gown, um, are all juxtaposed with their master's minute, careful work. Standing very close to his model in the picture's very vertically narrow design, the artist concentrates attentively to detail of what presumably is her head um, from the position of his paintbrush on a near life-sized canvas. He uses a mall, a mall stick to control his line, and that's what he's using there. Um, so going by the models and artists' attire, as work by David Bentley has shown, um, the use of the mall stick is actually anachronistic because they look like they are from uh, 18, late 13th, early 14th century. The mall stick doesn't come in until the 17th century. Um, but what I really like about the use of the mall stick, like Giotto's supporting hand, is I think um, a way of signalling the intense effort involved in painting, that control, that concentration. If Rossetti had attempted to match this effort in his own labours, Ruskin did not appreciate it. This was, paint, this was actually originally commissioned by Ruskin, but the critic later rejected the painting after an alteration made by Rossetti. He writes... I don't like my painting, my picture now. The alteration of the head from the stoop forward to the throwback makes the whole picture look quite stiff and stupid. Having received um, what Ruskin called a rather sulky reply from Rossetti, uh, Ruskin reposts, you are a conceited monkey. Think <laughs> thinking your picture's right when I tell you positively they are wrong. Undeterred, however, by Ruskin's chastening, um, Rossetti would go on to embark on a new type of painting two years later with Bocca Bacciata, which I will end with. Um, no longer satisfied with depicted, uh, depicting 
painters painting life-sized portraits, this new phase of Rossetti's career would eventually lead up to his own life-sized paintings of women in elaborate costume. Raskin would actually later fall out with Rossetti over these developments, specifically with Venus Verticordia. Um, but this reflects, I think, the evolving critical unease towards the former pre-Raphaelites misdirecting their artistic efforts to, quote, in another context, unworthy themes. But perhaps in his obsessive way with the voluminous forms of the curve and the flow of the hair, this conceited monkey manages to achieve Ruskin's sympathetic freedom, this time by the stroke of his own pencil. Thank you. Deborah, for a, a superb paper, and do please keep your questions uh, warm for the discussion at the end of this session. Uh, but it's my job now to introduce our next speaker, uh, Frances Farley, who is an associate lecturer at the Courtauld Institute, where she's completing, and apparently quite close to completing, a PhD titled Collecting and Identity in Manchester and Philadelphia, 1870 to 1914. It's a kind of new Atlanticism, which is a really important development in, uh, in the history of British art. Um, but her title today is Making Meaning in Rossetti's The Blessed Damosel, in the Manchester Art Museum. Please welcome Fran Varley. Thank you so much, Tim, um, and thank you, Deborah, for that as well. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. It is lovely to be here. So, oh, there we go. So, yeah, this is my title today. And I want to begin with Dante Gabriel Rossetti's The Blessed Damozel. It's a ravishing work of art, and it's one that I'm sure most of us in the room are familiar with. It tells the tale of a beautiful maiden, a stunner perhaps, observing her lover from paradise. The lover, from his earthly position on the predella at the base of the painting, pines for his lost paramour. The painting and its position in Rossetti's canon are well established, bolstered by the paired poem that the artist had first published in the germ in 1850. The painting typifies the seductive, mournful lusciousness of the artist's asceticism, folding Alexa Wilding's ethereal beauty into an imagined, embowered paradise. But today, I want to consider this preparatory study in chalk, which depicts a near-exact version of the 1878 painting that hangs in Tate right now. In particular, I want to consider the afterlife of the sketch, after it was donated by the artist to the Manchester Art Museum, a philanthropic and didactic project founded by an industrialist, cotton merchant and philanthropist named Thomas Horsfall. For the duration of this paper, I want to consider how the sketch was subsumed into the Manchester Art Museum's world. I intend to demonstrate how, under Horsfall's ideological direction, Rossetti's sketch was folded into a larger didactic scheme that prioritised process, technique and education over the individuality of the artist. Here, institutional frameworks remade the work's relations to its artist and its audience. This in turn reflected the political motivations of Horsfall's museum and informed how Rossetti's work was made visible to Manchester's working class public. I'll begin by outlining the origins and central aims of the Manchester Art Museum before exploring how Horsfall's approach to pedagogy, aesthetics and display co-opted the collection as a means to remake and reimagine in accordance with his own vision. I do this in part in response to Carol's opening remarks yesterday. I think that one possible response to the persistent stereotyping and assumptions of Rossetti's later works is to consider how it was that they existed in the real world, what role they played once they were subsumed into the collections and projects of other historical agents. I also want to attend to a current suggestion that popped up yesterday about ideas of ownership, exchange and display. The idea of a didactic art museum for Manchester was first proposed by Thomas Horsfall in a letter to the Manchester Guardian in 1877. If successful, such a museum could become the centre of the community and serve as a space where the working classes could not only experience and educate themselves about art, but a place where they could meet and organise in so-called rational recreation. Influenced by John Ruskin and driven by his devout Anglicanism, Horsfall considered artistic beauty to be, quote, food for the senses, and one that, quote, encouraged the mental life to thrive. A love of beauty was the precursor to contentment, it stimulated an aspirational and moral outlook and enabled a recognition of truth and godliness in the face of the horrors of industry. 
To bring art into the heart of the industrial city was, in Horsfall's eyes, a moral necessity. After just shy of a decade of temporary locations, the Manchester Art Museum found a permanent home at Ancoats New Hall in 1886. This location is significant. By the 1880s, Ancoats was one of the more notorious of Manchester's inner city neighbourhoods. Thanks to its location at the intersection of the Ashton and Rochdale canals, Ancoats was a useful location for factories. It thus also became a useful um, place in which to house workers. Many of these workers were from Manchester's growing immigrant community, beginning in the first half of the century with workers from Ireland, and then a wave of migration from Italy in the 1880s. Population influxes and economic growth contributed to overcrowding, destitution and disease, leading Ancoats to be likened to London's Whitechapel and a byword for the worst of the industrial city. Ancoats, in short, was considered a problem in need of a resolution. This image here, printed in the illustrated magazine The Graphic, crystallises this sense that Ancoats did not fit into late Victorian Manchester's idea of itself as progressive and forward thinking. Ancoats' smokestack, which you can see oh no, in that top left corner there, a push to the periphery, identified here by the clusters of chimneys and smoke. But smoke and smog pepper the view, though, casting almost the entirety of the scene into a murky cloud. What stands out is the foreground, here by the cathedral and the banks of the River Irwell, that is uncannily, unrealistically bright, clean and calm. The artist's hand colouring makes Manchester look much more like Houseman's Paris than its Victorian reality. The Manchester Art Museum itself consisted of several rooms and connecting hallways. Works of art, geological specimens and historical ephemera covered every surface. According to the museum's 1888 handbook, busts of Homer, Apollo, Dickens and Darwin peppered the entrance hall, where casts of the Parthenon friezes stood next to 17th century Dutch pottery and oil sketches of English rural life. Photographs of Paleolithic cave paintings were displayed next to a copy of Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper, and Morris and Co. provided furniture for model rooms. Each object was accompanied by an explanatory label outlining its, outlining its stylistic, technical or historical significance. Horsfall pulled in favours, asking William Morris and John Ruskin to contribute words for these notes and for donations of works on paper and preparatory materials from artists like Rossetti, Lord Leighton and George Frederick Watts. The handbook, which was priced at one penny and made available to all visitors, stretched to over 80 pages and gives a play-by-play -play commentary on the arrangement of the museum and, quote, how the various groups may be studied with advantage. One such group included the Blessed Damozel sketch. And I'm going to apologise in advance for the length of this quote that I'm about to give. Screen 6, South Side, contains an autotype copy of Mr Watts's beautiful picture of Hope, an etching of his watchman, What of the Night, and a group of pictures and copies relating to death. In this group is a study in chalk by Dante Gabriel Rossetti for his picture of the Blessed Damozel, given by him to the Art Museum as a sign of his approval of its objects and methods. The group contains also photographs of Mr. Watts's fine pictures of love and death, the angel of death, and time, death, and judgment, Rettel's woodcuts of death as a friend and death as an enemy, and Spangenberg's possession of death, a modern German representation of a subject which was often treated by old German artists. Most of the pictures on this screen are allegorical. That is, they are pictures in which the figures of men and women represent ideas, and as many persons fail to understand such pictures, full explanations of the meaning of the subjects are placed within this group, end quote. This arrangement of works of art might have looked something like this, and emphasises my central point, that within this particular context of display, Rossetti's sketch was valuable not for its merit, individuality, or its artist, but rather for its ability to articulate a particular pedagogical point. In this case, how artists use allegory to interpret ideas about death. Its selection and arrangement was deliberate and intended to make this one educational and preordained point entirely clear to its audience. Taken alone, Rossetti's sketch introduced one artist's mediation on the theme. This could then be compared, contrasted and inflected with the other works in the display, all unified by this single simple idea. In such a display, individual works of art are subsumed into the larger didactic whole, removing the need for erudition or taste from its audience, instead presuming them to be blank canvases unto which knowledge, particularly Horsfall's knowledge, could be imparted. And I've included here a photograph of one of the rooms inside the museum that I think helps to illustrate this point. Oh. 
The room, usually a gallery, has been rearranged to make space for a public lecture, and it looks to me that the Blessed Damozel scratch is pressed here against this right-hand wall, possibly with Spangenberg's possession of death arranged below. The sketch looks to be mounted on some sort of frame. The same is true for most of the other works in the room, which are hung on screens with casters at their base. These mobile screens could be moved out of the way when necessary, transported around the museum, even taken outside of the museum, and brought to the front of the lecture. For me, this raises the possibility that Horswell characterised the works in his museum as objects and evidence, intended to prove particular points or to make particular arguments. Works are not in this space by accident and every detail is being considered. The visitor to the museum must move around as instructed by the handbook and experience works in a way that have been largely predetermined. This then indicates paternalism, the, paternal, the paternalism of this didactic project. At the core of Horsfall's ideology was not only that the aesthetic literacy of the working class was a moral necessity, but that it was also an economic one. In a pamphlet entitled The Study of Beauty, Horsfall wrote, quote, that knowledge of beauty, which implies love of beauty, has great pecuniary value. Elsewhere, in a pamphlet entitled Art in Large Towns, he argued that bringing art to the masses is, quote, the giving to them of the power and the wish to discriminate between beauty and ugliness in order that they may give beauty to their work. In other words, the ability to recognise beauty was good for business. This point can be demonstrated, I think, through a recognition of the fact that the vast majority of works in this collection were reproductions, photographs or copies. What few original, quote unquote, works there were tended to be sketches or preparatory works just like The Blessed Damozel that had been donated to Horsfall directly from contemporary artists. It's quite clear that this is the case in this photograph. On the far wall at the back, for example, we can see what look to be photographs or copies of, sort of more medieval works of art. In the first instance, the use of reproductions was a pragmatic response to the scale of Horsfall's project. He simply couldn't afford to acquire the sort of collection of finished works of art that was necessary to realise his ambition. It's also the case that Horsfall argued publicly that works of art didn't have to be original or finished in order to support the artistic education of the working classes. But more significantly, Horsfall believed that the working classes could learn something about their own labours through an understanding of different materials, processes, techniques and forms. Drawing on the ideas of William Morris, Horsfall believed reproduced and copied works encouraged a discussion and education in artisan artisanal methods like engraving, lithography or photography. Rossetti's sketch then, alongside its emphasis on allegory, demonstrated a master's skills in modelling in chalk, while the Watts autotype, for example, demonstrated how oil paintings could be transformed in carbon print versions. The museum also contained model rooms and workshops and examples of model dress as part of what I consider to be an all-encompassing and indeed paternalistic philanthropy. The didacticism of the Manchester Art Museum represents a worldview that was deeply informed by class. Horsfall's work here genuinely did seem to want to improve the plight of the working people, and I have no doubt of the benevolence of his intentions. But it remains the case that this ideal was enacted through a moralising and dogmatic belief in the intellectual inferiority of the working class. Horsfall was certainly no Marxist. His writings homogenise the working class and rely on staid stereotypes of fickle workers unable to resist the temptations of drink, and of children who might only amount to something if only they could get out into nature. He believed deeply that it was his God-given duty as a member of the enlightened classes to support the destitute, but only to do so within a rigid and unchangeable social hierarchy. For Horsfall, instilling the working poor with a love of beauty led to better production and a greater willingness to accept the God-ordained order of things. That logic is expressed and perhaps parodied in this illustration, printed in the Manchester Times, that represents Horsfall as the knight in shining, shining armour, charging forth to save Ancoats from the worst of itself. In moving towards a conclusion then, I think it's possible to see within the Manchester Art Museum a tension between some of the genuinely radical aspects of Horsfall's ambition and the museum's role in maintaining and entrenching a class deference in the industrial city. Rossetti's The Blessed Damozel, recast and folded into Horsfall's dogmatic intellectual project, was fundamental to the mediation of this tension. This case study forms a very small part of a much larger PhD project that seeks to consider the art collection as a tool for social negotiation in Victoria Manchester and indeed in Philadelphia. I'm interested in thinking about collection, 
whether public, private or museological, as conglomerations of objects that were intentionally divorced from their original creation and had their meanings transformed and refolded, reworked perhaps into a new set of aims and ideas. These collections, in the case of the Blessed Damozel and the Manchester Art Museum, were not necessarily for better or worse, but nonetheless provide a way into thinking about the complex interrelation of art, artist, patron, collector, and audience in the industrial city. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Fran. We've had two wonderful talks on the poetics and politics of the relationship of art and labour in the uh, pre-Raphaelite period, and uh, we have one more coming, uh, this time from Tara Contractor. It's a great pleasure to introduce Tara, who is Assistant Curator of European Art at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, where she's bringing back the love of Victorian art to the citizens who loved it when they were the subject of France's uh, dissertation, but may have forgotten it in the intervening period, uh, but they, will, they are getting it back. Um, and uh, Tara completed her PhD at Yale a couple of years ago. Uh, the wonderful title is British Gilt, Gold in Painting from Blake to Whistler. Um, and it's in relation to that uh, work that she's going to speak today on the Little Sister Art, the Rossettis, and the Illumination Revival. Tara. Right. Hello, everyone. Um, it is a joy to be here. It has been such a wonderful last couple of days and yeah, having the best time. Let's get started. In 1850, a review of Dante Gabriel Rossetti's Ecce Ancilla Domini compared it to a, quote, leaf torn out of a missile. This apt comparison with illumination, which became a recurring motif in reviews of pre-Raphaelite pictures, calls attention to some of the most striking elements of Rossetti's paintings and watercolors of the 1850s, namely their blocky planes of color, glittering passages of gold, and close associations with written texts. Of course, the Pre-Raphaelites' interest in medieval manuscripts is well documented in their letters and has been explored by critics such as Julian Truhertz. But this interest in illumination should also be considered within the context of the larger illumination revival. By the 1850s, illumination had become something of a craze, due in part to new technologies like chromolithography, which allowed publishers to mechanically reproduce the colors and metallic ornaments of medieval manuscripts. Books and manuals for would-be illuminators circulated in unprecedented numbers and at affordable prices. Even deluxe volumes such as Humphrey's Illuminated Books of the Middle Ages, pages from which you see here, were issued in parts to keep the price down. Illumination manuals instructed readers in recreating manuscripts and often included pages such as those shown on this slide, which prompted readers to color in provided outlines. Colormen, such as Windsor and, New <laughs> Windsor and Newton, not only sponsored the publication of such manuals, but sold special paint boxes for amateur illuminators, <coughs> which, specifically, or, which typically contained bright jewel tone colors along with zinc white, lamp black, and gold. Significantly, manuscript illumination was a craft mainly taken up by middle-class and upper-class Victorian women who produced illuminated books and added illuminated elements to scrapbooks and albums. Though not always preserved, these objects were ubiquitous in Victorian parlors, and some examples still survive, though unfortunately these tend to exclusively be the <coughs> upper-class examples, um, with some exceptions. Illumination manuals directly addressed their female consumers, advising that, quote, a mother could scarcely do a thing more likely to benefit her children than to illuminate for them little volumes. <laughs> Which is a little silly. But, uh, figures from John Ruskin to the art teacher David Laurent Delora advocated illumination as a suitable source of income for women. And the predominance of women within organizations like the Illuminating Art Union led critics to dismiss the craft as the, quote, little sister art. So playing on the, the sister arts analogy. The feminine associations of the, um, of the Illumination Revival invite us to look at pre-Raphaelite medievalism from a new angle. In the following talk, I will discuss some works by Elizabeth Siddle and Christina Rossetti um, in this context, exploring how the gender dynamics of the Illumination Revival are shaping the Rossetti's radical art and its first reception. 
By 1857, when the works on this screen were painted, Siddle's interest in illumination was well known. Ruskin sometimes invited her to view his missiles, and he even offered to pay 150 pounds a year for her paintings and drawings. While not a fortune, this was about the same salary as a young male office clerk, and would have thus offered a degree of independence. We might even think of Siddle among the coterie of illuminators that Ruskin employed in the 1850s, which notably also included the social reformer Octavia Hill. What happens when we put Siddle's paintings and drawings into conversation with works by female illuminators? For instance, something like Elizabeth Ann Galton's album shown on the screen. What possibilities does this kind of comparison open up? For one, it invites us to speculate anew on Siddle's artistic origins. We know that she effectively began her career around 1849 when she showed some of her drawings to Walter Writing Deverell, the secretary of the government school of design. We will probably never know what these early drawings looked like, but illumination manuals are a highly plausible source of early training for a young woman of humble means and artistic aspirations. We can also think about the idiosyncrasies of Siddle's watercolor materials. She and Rossetti both share a preference for opaque surfaces enlivened with gold, but while her color palette is similar to his, it is slightly narrower and more jewel-like, dominated by cobalt blue, emerald green, crimson, and gold. This is a palette that closely parallels the colors in the cheaper illuminating boxes sold on the market, a fact which might well reflect her early use of such materials. We can now move to look at Siddle's compositions. Her cramped figures with their limbs at uncomfortable angles not only suggest art forms like stained glass, but also call to mind the way medieval manuscripts scrunch figures within illuminated capital letters. This is an effect that is only enhanced by her blocky geometric backgrounds with their crisp outlines of the doorways and the windows with their curves that, um, the curves and angles that come to recall the intersecting stems and crossbars of letter forms. We might, for instance, easily imagine the window in Clerk Saunders as the loop of an uppercase B. This letter-like quality is even more explicit in Lady Clare, where, as Jason Rosenfeld has pointed out, the S curve of the figures echoes the LS monogram of Siddle's signature at the bottom right. Where Dante Gabriel Rossetti's abiding interest in works like The Wedding of St. George and Princess Sabra is in surface pattern, Siddle's severe geometries seem to experiment with the visual logic of lettering, which was the focus of illumination books marketed towards women. Drawing perhaps from such sources, we see Siddle developing a unique, formally experimental approach to the double work of art, not simply illustrating stories and poems, but creating illustrations that graphically harmonize with accompanying text and letters. We can move now to thinking about Christina Rossetti. Though Christina Rossetti is celebrated primarily as a poet rather than a visual artist, her work can also be fruitfully examined within the context of the Illumination revival. Like an illuminator, she had a strong impulse to embellish written texts, her first known efforts being the 39 drawings she added to her first volume of poetry in 1847. One surviving example of her illustration practice is her copy of John Keeble's The Christian Year, likely embellished in the 1870s. Her penciled illustrations above the book's headings are private artistic responses to a beloved text. They closely recall the kinds of illustrations that appear alongside pasted poems in women's scrapbooks and commonplace books. For instance, Anne Wharton Stock's album shown on the screen. We can, however, also see her interest in medieval manuscripts reflected in the figure's flowy costumes and in motifs like the wide halo seen here. Her close study of chromolithographed manuscript facsimiles is equally suggested by her lively use of mismatched pattern, which is also a characteristic of her brother's work. While much of Christina Rossetti's visual art has been lost, examining her work within the context of the Illumination Revival can help us to imagine it more clearly. Surviving Rossetti family letters document the siblings' early collective production of scrapbooks and related ephemera, such as a family newspaper. Scrapbooking, however, remained a significant part of Christina's adult practice. She produced the majority of these books as gifts for children and hospital patients, which likely explains why none are known to survive. We know, however, that she was prolific in this medium. William Michael Rossetti later recalled, quote, when I called to see her and my mother, it was nine chances out of 10 that I found her thus occupied. 
I dare say she may have made up at least 50 biggest scrapbooks of this kind, taking some pains in adapting borderings to the pages, et cetera, et cetera. We can imagine that Christina Rossetti's scrapbooks might have looked something like the one on the screen here, which brings together illustrations cut from print sources, handwritten quotations, and hand-illuminated borders, or borderings, to use uh, William Michael Rossetti's term. And it's worth saying here how delighted I was uh, yesterday um, in Suzanne for, uh, Fajans Cooper's talk to learn about Jane Morris's commonplace books. These kinds of scrapbooks, layering texts with assembled imagery and medieval borders, open new possibilities for thinking about pastiche or assemblage as characteristics of pre-Raphaelite style. There are, for instance, moments in Dante Gabriel Rossetti's works which seem directly in dialogue with women's albums, um, and particularly with early photography albums, though not exclusively. The ivy leaf border around a work like Ruth Herbert recalls such albums perhaps even more strongly than it does a medieval illuminated page. Furthermore, Rossetti's practice of including family members in his compositions invites comparison with collaged family albums like those shown here, as well as with the, the pre-photographic precursors of these that played with sketches, prints, and silhouettes in analogous ways. A work like The Girlhood of Mary Virgin, which inserts portraits of Christina and Francis Rossetti into an imagined setting embellished with gold, seems to embrace the intimacy and eclecticism of women's albums. After yesterday's conversations about gender slippage in pre-Raphaelite art, we might even go so far as to describe it as a kind of stylistic cross-dressing. This self-positioning as feminine is arguably the subject and not the subtext of this painting, which, as the first picture exhibited with the initials of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, can be understood as a kind of artistic manifesto. As Elizabeth Pretjohn has noted, Mary slash Christina here acts as a surrogate for a Pre-Raphaelite artist. Embroidering a lily from life, she embodies the ideal of truth to nature. The painting's gilding, however, underscores its feminine aspect on a material level, the fine gold thread in her needle echoes the thin lines of gold painted through her hair, drawing an analogy between her gilded art and Rossetti's. There is no Puginesque bravado to this delicate gilding. It is very specifically the gilding of women's embroidery and of commonplace books. If The Girlhood of Mary Virgin is about the making of art and a bold public proclamation of pre-Raphaelite practice, it also frames this mode of art making as explicitly feminine. While the pre-Raphaelites presented themselves as a masculine brotherhood, their subversion of traditional codes of masculinity has been well discussed, particularly in reference to the androgynous figures which so often populate their canvases. The feminine association of the Illumination Revival is, however, important context for understanding the fierce, negative, critical reception of pre-Raphaelite painting and the centrality of gender within these critiques. When Robert Buchanan famously critiqued Rossetti's poetry as belonging to the fleshly school in 1871, he was alarmed by an introspective sensuality which he identified as feminine and which he believed had transformed the poet into a, quote, intellectual hermaphrodite. But these anxieties are present even in Rossetti's first reviews, which focus on stylistic elements such as his gilding, and use language like timid, wasting, weak, and perversion to suggest a departure from conventional Victorian masculinity. If we read Rossetti's images of a pre-industrial past as a critique of Victorian commercialism and industrialism, we might also read a similar critique in his cultivation of this feminine style. A work like The Girlhood of Mary Virgin becomes not only an implicit defense of undervalued women's art forms, but perhaps also a rejection of a public-facing masculine sphere associated with industry and commerce. Viewed within the context of the Illumination Revival, the Rossettis emerge as artists who recognized feminine craft as a generative site for radical art. Some of the most idiosyncratic elements of their work find parallels in women's illuminated albums, from their glittering materials to their experimental and deeply personal harmonies of text and image. Acknowledging the widespread interest in illumination among Victorian women demythologizes Dante Gabriel Rossetti's interest in the subject, making him just one of multiple sources available to Siddle and Christina Rossetti. Indeed, their apparent mutual dialogue with the illumination revival 
reaffirms the idea that influence between them was more multi-directional than has typically been assumed. Thank you. I wanted to start uh, the ball rolling with a question uh, uh, which preoccupied um, political economists throughout the period that we're talking about, the relationship between labor and value. Um, uh, and there's one set of theoretical uh, sort of explorations of that in terms of economics. But the particular issue in relation to labor and value that I want you all to, to just reflect on in relation to what you've talked about, because I think it came up in all the talks, is the, uh, the value of fine art versus the value of what might have been called applied arts or decorative arts, the kinds of things that were taught at South Kensington, um, and you know, wh where uh, the study of the particular kinds of objects that you've been looking at might blur or complicate that uh, line or even place it under erasure. So then who wants to pick up fine decorative um, I can go Please do, <laughs> yes. Thanks, Deborah. Yeah. Um, no, that's a really interesting question and, and one that my next book really thinks about. Um, I'm fascinated with this idea of um, Ruskin running all these forms of labour and all these kinds of labour together, which is why I think you know, his comments about Whistler and Fors Clavigera are so incredibly telling. Um, I, I think... A lot of a lot of Ruskin's um, beliefs in in labour and the th this kind of egalitarian treatment of all of labour of all kinds really um, is what influenced William Morris. And this is funny to us now when we think of Ruskin as this high conservative and William Morris as this socialist figure. When actually they had so many corresponding you know confluences, um, um, different kind of relationality. Um, I think I really like this idea of pleasurable labor, which I think is what um, really is the, the, the phrase that gathers together both Ruskin's and um, William Morris's idea. I think, you know, I'm, I'm sure that both of you can speak more um, articulately than I can on discriminating both kinds of labour, but I'm interested in also on, on the gathering together of forms of labour. Um, Ruskin very specifically states um, that, you know, Whistler's flinging of the pot of paint um, is fascinating because it's, it's not just... Um, it's decorator's paint, right? A pot of paint is not a unit of measure that is used in fine art. It's decorator's paint. And in Fors Clavigera, which is um, written to Sheffield workmen, um, they would have recognised that unit. And um, Ruskin's pejorative use of this um, is, is quite a class-based slant on a pot of paint as opposed to, yeah, a more refined unit of, yeah, fine art. That's absolutely brilliant. I mean, just, just to, to sort of amplify the question for the, for the two of you, thank you, Deborah, that's really, really helpful. Um, would this be a different exhibition if it was at the Victoria and Albert Museum? If the relationality of the Rossetti circle was at the V&A, uh, then maybe a very different set of issues would, would come forth. Um, and I think, you know, that if a William Morris exhibition was held at the Tate, you know, would that break down this artificial binary that's actually built into the architecture of museums and art history? Uh, so, you know, those are those are the sort of questions underlying my my thoughts. But and that's quite interesting, I think, in terms of what Horsfall was doing, which is why I mentioned it. Yeah, definitely, that sort of context of display. I think what I found quite striking about your question, Tim, and De Deborah's response in relation to Horsfall and what I was talking about is. Hustle's obviously a huge acolyte of Ruskin, and for me, what is quite telling is that he's doing this in the 1880s, the moment at which Ruskin's power is kind of beginning to wane, and ideas about art and what art is, who art is for, and all that kind of thing are starting to change. Mm -hmm. And Horsfall has quite, I kind of mentioned it, but like a really public um, debate in the British Architect, a periodical, with Leighton and Watts about whether there should be originals in museums and how useful are copies. And Leighton and Watts are kind of saying, well, you know, photographs are fine, they're kind of useful to study from, but, like, they don't really have much, like, 
value in an art museum because art is about the erudition and the ability to understand the genius of the artist and what's going on. And Horsfall kind of retorts that because for him it is about that practicality, it's about that understanding of these as things that are made because of his quite classed belief that understanding how things are made will make the workers of Ancoats better textile weavers mm -hmm. or better iron mongers or whatever that might be. So I think it's quite an interesting sort of who, like almost what it's intended for and who it's aimed mm -hmm. at. Like it's quite, you know, a nice middle class thing to be like, oh, we can take value in our painting and we can take time in our labour, but the reality, I think, for the working classes is quite different and that comes out quite strongly in the Manchester Art Museum. It's interesting, I the think. Rossetti is an original. Yes. That's the one, apparently, the only there's one really, I could see in yeah, the room in that, that room, wasn't a reproduction. There's really not many. There's quite a few sketches from Watts. He has quite a lot from Ruskin. Actually, Ruskin gives Horswell quite a lot of stuff. Um, and he commissions a few new works from sort of local Manchester art, artists that are kind of sketches of the Pennines and local scenery. But beyond that, there's very little of original work. I, I'm, I'm kind of struck by thinking about the public and the private as spaces where the idea of value is being worked out, um, kind of undervaluing of art that might be made in private spheres, um, the fact that uh, someone's private album or embroidery that's not seen is going to have so much less value than even a, a photograph of a, a, a publicly displayed facsimile, um, I think is a really curious fact here. Um, and I think it plays into also these ideas of the utility of art that we're talking about, of um, what is it meant to do to the public and what is it meant to do to the private. Um, I know they're kind of bleeding together in interesting ways too with these ideas of like, you have to be illuminating little books for your children um, <laughs> to, to teach them. It can't just be a thing that is private for you. It has to be for the sake of something. So anyway, this is just me musing on this, but I think the public and the private is an important Absolutely. dichotomy here. The, the um, insistence on facsimile versus the debate between facsimile versus original is also very relevant to our concerns over AI art, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. the labor or effort um, or lack thereof and how mm -hmm. that shapes our understanding of the value of that kind mm -hmm. of art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah, I never mm -hmm. thought about that. So. Mm -hmm. Opening it to the floor, yes, uh, there, Kate. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, thanks for all the talks. Um, I have a question for the first two speakers. Um, I was really interested in the point that um, Francis made about um, the way that workers didn't need to have like erudition to understand or to understand a work, and so it was sort of handed to them the meaning. Um, and I'm interested in how this kind of relates to what um, Deborah was talking about with you know questions of labor and effort, and then also kind of the legibility of a work in a pictorial sense. And I'm curious to hear from you. Um, both about kind of how you square the relationship between the work of the artist and then the work of the viewer. Yeah, I think what I struggle with the most in squaring that is most of the evidence that I've been able to find about the Manchester Art Museum has come from the perspective of Horsfall. He writes so extensively. There's handbooks, there's treatises, there's just so much stuff about him really articulating his ideas for his museum and he has a picture lending project and this whole big scheme. And there's also lots of letters with Ruskin, but I've not really found anything that explains how this was genuinely experienced by sort of Uncoats workers that it was aimed at. There's, you know, a bit of writing in the press about how many people are going, but that doesn't really explain or expand on that genuine audience experience. And I think for me, it's always the thing that I find hard to square in thinking about ideas of, you know, class hierarchy and dogmatism in the 19th century is that we really do just lack at least as far as I've been able to find, the evidence to be able to kind of strike that balance. So that's not really an answer to your question, but just my sort of methodology in that. Yeah. Um, no, that's a really good question. I, I'm afraid I have to answer again with Ruskin, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is not what anyone wants to hear. But Ruskin has this... Um, Ruskin gets, gets quite... Um, changes his mind about detailed finish and sort of reasons... Um, I can't remember which year specifically where he says, you know, oh, I begin to, you know, with the advent of photography, I begin to wish for a little less finely finished detail. And he actually says that, you know, um, by painting more, it also taxes the viewer more. Um, and, and I think 
um, my first, my PhD was on access. The first book is about excess. Um, so I think it's interesting, this idea that the pre-Raphaelites paintings tax too much or are almost sort of taxing on the reader uh, or viewer. Um, and you see this a lot in Holman Hunt's paintings as well. The, um, and, you know, Joyce and, and colleagues have had such a great um, 2003 book on pre-Raphaelite technique that actually explains that um, it's because Holman Hunt had exceptional eyesight, probably you know better than just 2020 vision. And so, what do we? What happens when and the artist can see more than we can and tries to reproduce that? Um, it it taxes us more, and it it also is another form of labor that I think Ruskin is trying to square with in his, in his theories of aesthetic spectatorship. Thank you. And I've been asked to say, uh, please identify yourself when you ask a question. So I will retrospectively identify Professor Caitlin Beach, who just, just asked the questions at Fordham University and speaking later. Um, uh, question at the back. Yes. Hi, I'm Susie. Hi. Um, my question's Beckham, sorry. Yeah. Uh, my question's for uh, Deborah, so also fantastic papers, really, really fascinating. Um, on the topic of Dante Gabriel Rossetti's labour in his creation of artworks, and I guess that what you said before about the idea of pleasurable labour, what are your thoughts on his obsession, uh, repetition of whether it's sort of particular people's faces or sometimes the same image over and over and over again throughout a career. How do you, in your work, kind of like reconcile, I guess, that idea of pleasurable labour versus perhaps a slightly more obsessive repetition? Thank you. Hey, thank you. Yeah, that's a really fascinating question. Um, a longer version of my paper, which I have to cut out a lot of material, um, included his obsessive rubbings out, as Ruskin said. Mm -hmm. I think one of the quotations I had um, was about Ruskin saying, oh, you should do careless or slight work sometimes. And that's why I really like, um, well, Ruskin says that's why he appreciates the, the Passover of the Holy Family. Um, I'm sorry if I'm not looking at you directly, by the way. I can't really sorry. see. <laughs> okay, hi. Thanks, that's really helpful. Um, so, yes, he... Uh, Ruskin says um, that you know you are allowed to spend as much put as much labor as you would like in that picture but no more rubbings out you know he, he's very like sort of no more rubbings out um, but and, and in fact Selwyn image um, who later takes over after Ruskin is Slade professor of art at Oxford um, has a really fond recollection where um, I think this is after Rossetti's death. Ruskin shows him the Passover of the Holy Family gathering bitter herbs. And um, Selwyn is amazed, loves the picture. And Ruskin tells him, uh, Ruskin sort of says, I had to carry that off, finished or unfinished, because R Rossetti wouldn't stop scrubbing, scraping that, uh, the, the child's face, uh, you know, Christ child's face out and putting it back in again. And I was so afraid that he would scrape up the entire picture. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's, it's interesting because obviously um, it's, it's, it's not pleasurable, right? It's deeply unhealthy. And I think that that's why as well, um, with regards to critics being really uncomfortable at, at this kind of obsessive, meticulous effort now being... Um, assigned or, or attributed to sensuous um, subjects that really discomforted critics. Um, you know, one, one of my last slides, which I didn't put on because I didn't have time, shows the 14 uh, Persephone's, which really, you know, speaks to this idea of obsession. Um, I was talking to, to Carol as well, who, who actually... Um, gave me a really lovely tidbit for the book, uh, which is that coral, which is what Rossetti was addicted to in the later part of his life, um, is, was actually um, prescribed for overwork. He talks about coral being a commercial necessity, and Ford Maddox, um, Ford talks about, um, no, Ford Maddox Brown talks about how. Um, no, Ford Maddox Ford, yes. Sorry. <laughs> uh, talks about how he had this double bind because 
um, without chloral meant that he had insomnia, and if he had insomnia, it meant he couldn't sleep, and if he couldn't sleep, he couldn't work. Um, so it began to have such a point of stress and overwork and burnout, which are issues that are really contemporaneous to us now. Um, and I think part of trying to look at pleasurable ideas of labor in conjunction with that kind of overwork in the 19th century is a way of trying to recuperate how our current understandings of labor in late cap under late capitalism um, are often, is often thought of as being really traumatic. It's really interesting to compare that with the production of multiple versions of paintings by an artist like Frith, for example, yeah. who, for straightforward labour value, economic reasons, you know, made a living by creating an excellent painting and then replicating it for the people who wanted a, a version of it, uh, which is often you know, looked down on as a, as a kind of scurrilous tactic, but of course it was a perfectly rational mm -hmm. response, but it wasn't a kind of psychotic response to the, yeah. <laughs> to the scenario. So, yeah. uh, any more questions? Uh, yes, one here. Back. Sure. Hi, thank you. I'm Thomas Cooper. Um, your papers are brilliant. I have a question for all of you, um, and it's based on something that came up in the, I think, the, the last talk, definitely. And I'm curious about um, the word craft and whether it's useful for you um, in, in the ways that you're thinking through um, representations and ideologies of labour and, and art making. Hmm. <laughs> I, I think it is a really useful word. I think I like it because I think it inherently draws attention to the materiality of things, which I think is so easy to lose sight of in a time where so often we're looking at photographs and digital reproductions of paintings rather than the things. So I think I like to think about even the craft of painting. Um, so I... I like to keep it, though I, I think we do need a broader definition of it, and like the kind of idea of art and craft as inherently separate, I think is not useful, but I think taking a broad definition of craft draws attention to the thinginess of things that we need to keep sight of. Was illuminating a craft or an art? Oh, such a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I want to talk about it as a, as a craft, because I am so interested in the practice of doing it. Yeah. Um, the kind of slowness of it, the intimacy of doing it. I mean, I think when you think about those aspects of it, it comes to life in a different way. Yeah. yeah, I find craft a really informative word, actually, when I'm thinking about collections. And I was quite struck by it, especially, I think it was Imogen's talk yesterday, thinking about kind of these spaces, these house museums, as things that have been constructed and made. And I think that a lot about looking at collections, especially collections that no longer exist, just imagining them as things, like I said, as these like conglomerations of objects that people have put together and they have labored over, they have tracked things down, they have traced them, they have worked out how to hang them, how to arrange them. There's something quite tactile and involved, I think, about a collection that often, in a lot of sort of received histories of 19th century collecting, we kind of lose that sense of involvement, engagement. They're kind of just things that exist in quite kind of monolithic and neutral ways. And I'm thinking about the kind of process of making a collection is quite informative mm -hmm. for me. I wonder if the word art craft, which we've inherited from the arts and crafts movement mm -hmm. with a very particular spin on it, does a kind of injustice to the craft skills of the mm -hmm. manual laborers who were attending the museum. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think of what was actually involved in terms of manipulating mm -hmm. metalwork or ceramics mm -hmm. or you know, mm -hmm. any of the other woodwork, any, any of the other things that they would be doing in their daily mm -hmm. lives, they were actually craftsmen mm -hmm. rather than some kind of idea of Fordist automation has been projected backwards yeah. onto the period you're talking about. I suppose you can read the, like, class thing into that, that I don't think Horsfall fully quite understands right. Right. that because he is part of this idea that's kind of the horrors of industry and we yeah. must save right. people from being turned into machines without right. kind of recognising right. that. So I think that's where, for me anyway, he kind of differs from Ruskin to bring Ruskin back into it because he is kind of instilled with that economic bent, right. that kind of Manchester liberalism that Ruskin doesn't really work through ever really. Well, right. yeah. And there's, I, I was thinking in your talk that there was this really interesting um, anti-northernness as well, right? <laughs> because um, when the critics shun Rossetti's stunners, um, they are really disdainful at the fact that 
um, he finds a market for them with northern yeah. businessmen. Um, and there is this sense that they have no taste, mm -hmm. right? And I think part of the aesthetic education that Hosswald is really um, interested in it is kind of, yeah, thinking about that. Yeah. Was there a northernness yeah, thing to I guess it's quite double-layered as well, this almost like sort of London critics being quite critical of northern industrious for liking yeah. these kind of things, and then Horsfall in turn being quite derisive of the working classes for not even understanding these yeah. things. So it's almost like constantly playing one-upmanship, I suppose, mm -hmm. in order to kind of keep this kind of hierarchy. It's kind of amusing that the person who articulates that ridiculous view in the present is Jonathan Jones of the Manchester <laughs> Guardian. But anyway, we were going to, uh, there was a, a hand at the back. Can't see who it is. Please say who you are. Melissa again. It is, um, thank you for that. Uh, if, sorry, it's Melissa Gustin. Um, picking up on sort of a bit of that question of materiality and craft, um, all three of you sort of in passing mentioned Watts, and this is very much a how can I make this about me kind of question um, in relation to Watts, but also about one of the things that was sort of coming out is the various forms of art history that were happening and art history and understanding of materialities and process. And Deborah, that, that image, the painting version of Giotto painting Dante um, made me think of a quote from Watts about Michelangelo and effort, that he, Watts disdained Michelangelo's sculptures because he was prevented from dashing his thoughts into the stone by the effort involved in carving versus the effort involved in fresco painting. And so I thought that was a really interesting parallel um, between the effort involved in slow oil painting, in reworking, and the material process of fresco painting. Um, and I wondered if, for all three of you, if that question of material, and the other one, sorry, before I forget the other side of that question, was that image of the Manchester Art Gallery with the photographs on the black screens and this idea of art history and displaying process in thematic sections made me think of Abby Varberg. Um, and I'm wondering if there's a connection across all three papers between materiality, effort, and forms of art history mm -hmm. happening in these discussions that you could maybe pick out a bit. It's a bit open-ended. Yeah. You'll pick Watts, Warburg, <laughs> or art history. They're all deep, rich topics. I guess since, since, since you mentioned Manchester, I guess I'll start. Um, I genuinely haven't really thought about the kind of parallel development of art history as a discipline, and I think it's something that, as you were saying, that makes so much sense, and I really need to kind of think through that, that kind of even the way he's displaying things on the board, kind of on the black screen that you say, kind of reminds me of my own presentation and how we're taught to write presentations. So, yeah, like, let's talk about that, because that's like a... Yeah. <laughs> I, I suppose I'm struck by thinking in, in the Illumination Revival, there's a really interesting tension between is this going to be about using the same kinds of materials that medieval people would have used and using the same kinds of um, imagery or are we going to use brand new synthetic pigments and new kinds of metallic um, illuminating possibilities and there's even um, a great passage in I think the, one of the David De Laurent Delora books where he talks about um, oh we should be putting everything modern in into the margins of this where we used to have knights and snails and gargoyles and things we need we should now have factories and mm. and pulleys and and there's like oh I wonder what that would look. very few people did that which is um, I've, I've actually never seen anyone answering his call for that but I think also very interesting that it's a revival that's coming out of the fact that they're able to make chromolithography books mm. that um are really wild to read through because you get um hundreds of years of book styles in a single volume sometimes I mean there's I think the eclect eclecticism is a useful I don't know, handle for thinking about some of those issues and the way these are being published. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I sort of, my reply actually leads up to a question that Fran maybe can answer because I was fascinated that um, Rossetti was placed 
amongst lots because um, in his Art of England lectures, Ruskin actually has two lectures, one on um, the realist school of Dante Gabriel Rossetti and Holman Hunt, mm -hmm. and then the second one, the following one, um, the mythic school of G.F. Watts and uh, Edward Burne Jones. Um, it, it's really fascinating because he because Ruskin contrasts um, the material veracity of Rossetti and Holman Hunt. And um, he actually says, he, he gives one of my favourite analogies that, you know, if you were to give Rossetti and Edward Burne Jones um, the task of illustrating Genesis, Rossetti would, would paint either um, Adam and or Eve and Burne Jones the days of creation. And I think it speaks to that kind of material veracity which Ruskin defines as I know that's not the kind of material you're ta materiality you're talking about um, but Ruskin defines it as you know the it it is it very similitude right the the it looks like it could verily have happened um, and I think that by play yeah I wonder what if you could say a little bit more about what you think it does to um, it does to Rossetti's preparatory sketch by by curating it in and amongst really allegorical work um, like what's like Burne Jones. Yeah. In saying that, it then also brings me back to Melissa's point about the sorts of art history that Hoss was engaging in and making, and he's kind of doing his own thing. Where I genuinely don't think he cares that much about whether Rossetti or Watts would have been happy on the same display. Like I really think he's decided that these images best represent allegories of death and they will best represent that to the public that's coming into his audience it's like this entirely pragmatic approach that's his own personal decision about what makes most sense mm -hmm. and so that's what he's going to do which mm -hmm. maybe is not the most like articulate or intelligent answer yeah. but I do think there's that kind of pragmatism it's a different kind yeah. of it's pedagogical as opposed exactly. to uh, yeah scholarly yeah, yeah. and it's kind of iconographic rather than the works of the masters which is what exactly. Henry Tate he's did kind of when he founded this institution that, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I know there are more questions. Please save them for the panel discussion at the end. But let's thank our three brilliant speakers for this. <laughs>